Assalamu alaikum everyone. Hi. Uh, so thank you for coming. So uh, we're very blessed uh, today to have uh, our Sheikh Rehman uh, Arastu, who just uh, flew in uh, Thursday from Chicago. So um, Sheikh Rehman Arastu has uh, an undergrad degree uh, from Princeton in evolutionary biology before going to a home and studying in the Hausa for about eight years. So um, if I may just quickly say, we had basically uh, a reading group going on last year uh, with um, al Kafi. Uh, so al Kafi is basically the, uh, a compilation of the traditions of the Apple Bates, uh, so a hadith and basically uh, Sheikh Lugana is still is part of a movement uh, in Chicago, Islamic literacy, amongst other things, that basically work on providing commentaries uh, from Arabic to uh, European languages, namely mostly English at this point. Um, so basically, alhamdulillah, we're very blessed to have this because it's a new resource that's available for uh, Muslims who don't necessarily have the uh, requirements in Arabic to access difficult uh, books in these languages. Um, so it was very, it was actually a very enlightening reading group, and uh, we're very happy now to have him here with us. Uh, so please uh, welcome uh, our Sheikh uh, with the loudest of your salawats. Alhamdulillah, we love the Alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala Muhammad wa ala ahli bayti wa tayyibin al Allahumma can you all hear me? Okay. And the fan's very loud. Okay. Is there a way to turn the fan down? Or? Do you want to try? Okay, that's fine. That's fine. I'll talk a little louder. Um, if, if you can't hear me, then just, just uh, give me a sign. So, speak yeah, closer if you can't hear me. Okay. Was a um, Caucasian um, person interested in Islam. He was a fire marshal in the local fire department. And he said that he had been researching Islam, he had read the Quran, these kinds of things, and he wanted to come in and just talk about some ideas and ask, ask questions and things like that. Um, so in his, uh, he was knowledgeable, he was very thoughtful, and one of the things that he said was, he said that one of my uh, hesitations in converting to Islam is that I feel like Islam is a very foreign religion. I feel like Islam is a very foreign religion. And that statement and that kind of the juxtaposition of those two things really struck me and I realized that that's, that's so true. That we have made Islam into a foreign religion and to such an extent that if you want to become Muslim, you have to become Arab or Irani or Indian, Pakistani. You have, to, you have to change your culture and become like that and dress like that and eat like that and talk that language. You can't just, it's not just a matter of changing your beliefs and your um, the practices of your life, we have to change the entire culture of your of your existence, and that's that's a huge price to pay for converting to 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 another religion, and it makes it so incredibly daunting for someone to do that. Not only do they lose their family in many cases, where they they are disowned by family members who think that they have now become apostates from a court, another their religion, they have betrayed their like you know their ancestry, their all these things. Now they're cut off from their own family, they're cut off from their social circles, oftentimes they can't get married in their own social circles because both of religious considerations and also because of social considerations. And now they can't even fit in into this, this new foreign culture of Islam because it's foreign. It's not American, it's not Canadian. So it's a, it's a huge thing and this, this really um, struck me. I've been thinking about it, it's been like three, four years now since I met this, this um, gentleman. I don't think he ever converted, as, as far as I know. Um, that, that particular consideration was too much and he wasn't able to resolve that issue and um, to my knowledge he didn't convert to Islam. So I want to speak a little bit about this idea about Islam being a foreign, foreign religion. So let's start out by talking about kind of a, the narrative of Muslim, uh, of Islam coming to the new world. Right, so um, Islam came um, via immigrants um, during the last 50 to 60 years for the most part. They were, Slaves who were Muslim. There were other kind of um, individuals who came as Muslims earlier. Um, I read a book recently uh, about what was one um, person who came who, who had converted to Islam. He was one of, one of the first documented Caucasian converts to Islam back in I believe 18 
70s or something like that, just after the Civil War in the U.S. and uh, some of his uh, engagements uh, and things like that. Uh, but anyway, it wasn't a mass movement or anything like that until these immigrants came in the last 50 to 60 years, uh, primarily from the subcontinent, India, and Pakistan, and uh, Iran, and uh, Arab countries, and so forth. So for the most part, these people who came over, these Muslims who came over, they, they, their, their conception of Islam, Islam was basically part of their culture. They were Muslim by default. Because that, was, that, was just, that was just part of who they were, because they were born into it. That's just and so when they came over, they uh, brought their culture, their language, all those other things, and Islam also kind of came with the package, just because that's part of who they were. Some of these people, they had as a priority to assimilate in the new culture, and part of assimilation is relinquishing those foreign ties, and so as they relinquish their language and their dress and all those other things to become Canadian or American, they also relinquish Islam because that was also part of culture, foreign culture, and so Islam also went. And we have a whole generation, a generations now of uh, very uh, secular people who are either Muslim in name only and, and really have nothing else to do with Islam, or they have left Islam totally and, and you know, it's, it has no part in their life at all. Other people held on to that culture of Islam um, mainly because they realized that that was part of, that was kind of their one link to something solid. That was part of their identity. Just as they felt like they, they valued being Indian, Pakistani, Iranian, Arab, whatever it was, and they liked the, the language and the you know, food and all those things, they also kept Islam to that same extent as part of their culture because it was something solid to hold on to when everything else was changing in the world around them as they tried to, tried to uh, fit into their new, their new societies. There are very few, I think, who actually consciously were Muslim, who had actually decided to be, to be and remain Muslim, and they came over as well. But they also, for the most part, maintained that cultural tie. It was a culture of Islam. I think maybe because that gives you a sense of identity, even here, when things are very strange, everything's changing around you, at least you have you know, you could reach out to someone who speaks your, your old language, like mother tongue, and who eats the same kind of food, and you can get together and you feel a sense of bonding. I think a lot of you are Iranians, and maybe you have the same sort of feeling over here as well. You're all kind of sticking together, always doing these together, not really mingling too much, because you feel that's a little bit familiar. Uh, you have old friends, or even, not even old friends, but you eat the same food, and speak the same language, so you feel familiar. And I had the same experience when I went to Iran. I was in a foreign place, a very hostile place in many ways. Um, uh, um, and, and so the, the Western students, uh, English-speaking students, we kind of bind together and, and socialize together because that was something familiar um, in, in a very strange, strange time. Um, the result of this, though, is that all these different Muslims, they came from very different cultural contexts. And when they brought that cultural Islam to the New World, it, it made for pockets of very different kinds of Islam very different flavors of Islam. And so you have Indo-Pak um, Islam versus uh, Iranian Islam. And even within those, you have sub subcultures. Uh, so there's certain, I know from the Indian context, I know certain cities have their own culture and, and it's different from another city and, and these kinds of things. So you have cultures that are separate from other cultures and subcultures, and there are all these lines being drawn or, or kind of being brought over from the old world. And in those, in those countries, in those places, culture was relevant. That was, that was part of who people were. But now when you bring it into an artificial environment and juxtapose those things together, those people together with those cultures, then obviously there's going to be friction, uh, tension, separation, and it, it doesn't allow for a, a kind of a clean mingling of, of, of people who have common beliefs, but they have very disparate cultures. And so we end up with these kind of um, Oftentimes, separate mosques. You have the Iranian mosque and the Indian Pakistani mosque, and, or the Hyderabad mosque and the Lahore mosque, the Lucknowi mosque, and all these different things where you have great separation along uh, ethnic lines and linguistic lines rather than based on ideological and religious lines. So, I want to speak a little bit about the relationship between culture and religion. For example, um, we have, I think we have a tendency, um, as, as Salafis and Wahhabis have an influence on Islam in, in the world. They have a, a kind of a, a idea about Islam and culture that really kind of uh, strips Islam of any sort of culture. Their ideal is that Islam is something uh, that can be uh, separated from language and culture and those kinds of things. And the only culture that, that they recognize is something that's 
founded directly in textual kind of textual things from, from the, the Middle Ages and the Prophet's lifetime. So that's definitely not, not the ideal, that's not, not um, a, a, healthy, a healthy view at all. But what is the relationship between culture and, and uh, religion, Islam in particular? So I have a very, um, it's actually a very profound parable, but it sounds like a very silly parable. It's a parable of a cookie cutter. Right? It's not in any Aesop's fables or anything like that. It's a parable of a cookie cutter. So imagine you have cook cookie dough, and you take a cookie cutter and you, you plop it in the middle of a cookie dough. Some things remain inside of the design, and some things are extracted. Right? That's that's the relationship between Islam and and existing culture. Right? Existing culture has, for instance, clothing. Some some parts of the clothing might be decent and and uh, suitable Islamically, and some parts are not. Some parts of Cuisine might be halal, and some parts might be haram. Um, uh, music and art and all these different aspects of culture, some parts are going to fit inside of that cookie cutter, and then some parts are going to be extruded and excluded from that and have to be cast away. So Islam then has kind of a, a negative role um, on culture where it decides what parts of an existing culture are, are uh, compatible and what parts are incompatible. That's kind of a negative relationship that Islam has with respect to culture. Um, but it's not limited to that. So Islam is not simply speaking to compatibility versus incompatibility. Oh, let me say this as well. So compatibility, whatever lies within the cookie cutter, is not necessarily one with Islam. It isn't Islamic. It is simply compatible with Islam. And that's, this, I, that's where sometimes uh, things are conflated and we end up with thinking that um, Iranian food is Islamic food. Wearing a dishdasha or a thobe is Islamic dress. Wearing pants and a shirt or wearing a tie, that's un-Islamic. Somehow we, we start to think that only like, those things that lie within that cookie cutter, those are, um, that's the only way you can do it as a Muslim and anything else that's, 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 that's not, not within that, or at least not within my cookie cutter's dough, um, that, that's not, not Islamic. But Islam also has a positive effect on culture. That's the kind of a negative effect. It takes existing culture and it includes something, excludes some things. But Islam also brings culture to the table. It also creates culture. Right? If you think of um, the heavy influence that Islam has on building, on shaping the culture of a people. Right? It, it creates, for instance, a culture of God-centeredness. Where in Islamic culture, Allah is the center of everything. If you do things, even mundane tasks become special and re religious and beneficial on a, a spiritual level if and only if they are done with a, with a sense of God-centeredness, where you do it for the sake of God or, and you do it according to the laws of God and in a way that's pleasing to God. Right? Then even a mundane task like earning a living for your family takes on value. Because now if you're doing it, if you're doing it simply for personal fame and glory, for personal wealth, then there's no value in it. But as soon as you do it now because this is the duty I have imposed on me by God to now support myself in a dignified way, support my dependents in a dignified way, have enough money to be able to be a backbone of society and be able to support beneficial projects or support poor people and these kinds of things, then all of a sudden, even if a mundane task like earning a living becomes something special because of that culture now of God-centeredness. Or community-centeredness. Right, it's not puts a premium on, on community and being together and interacting with people. It doesn't allow for, it doesn't encourage people to separate and kind of do their own thing and not, not interact with others. It's constantly pushing us towards doing things communally. And you see little elements of it, for instance, like it's it's makru, it's disliked to eat by yourself. It's makru to live by yourself, to sleep by yourself. Right? So, so even those little kind of pushes, they push us in a direction where we should try to, if we can, whenever we eat, invite someone to eat with you. If you're, if you're going to figure out where to live, don't live by yourself. Try to find roommates if you're not married. If you're married, then you have your family to live with. Right? So it's pushing us towards being with people. It's, it's better, it's much better to be in congregational prayer than it is to pray by yourself. Even like, um, to the extent that praying in congregation, even if it's distracting, even if it's a quick prayer, just doing the bare minimum, um, and all that, that's better, even if it's delayed. But praying in congregation is better than praying the absolute best prayer with the longest surah, the best pronunciation, and the, at, the, at the beginning of time, all by yourself. 
Right, so obviously these are just examples of some of the, the pushes that Islam has towards society and community. So it then creates a culture of communalism and being together and interacting with people. Um, it creates a culture, for instance, of being principled. Living according to ideal, ideals and principles, not compromising on things that I know to be right simply for the sake of expedience. Right? Because it's convenient, that's not a good enough reason for me to give up on principle. And that's a, that's a, that's a cultural thing that, that's going to permeate uh, this Muslim society and make Muslim society distinctly different from other societies that might look at uh, exigencies and think that you know, those things can be, we can, we can give in to those things even if we have to compromise on principle sometimes. That's, that's where we find. Or um, think of the Islamic uh, um, insistence on hygiene. Right? There's a premium put on hygiene, personal hygiene, keeping yourself clean through wudu and ghusl and making sure that you're not um, uh, offensive in your appearance or your smell, that you, you push people away from you. Right? So that's a culture then that's developed. Um, just as a, a side note, when, I, like, when you go to the prayer room downstairs, one of the first things that you notice is it smells terrible. Right? It smells of feet as soon as you enter. Right? That's a Muslim place, but if, if someone else is to come in um, and, and enter that place and they know this is a Muslim uh, prayer area, the first, thing, first impression they have is, is, it, is it's filthy and it smells really bad. Right? That's not in Islam, that's, that's not outside of Islamic culture. Islamic culture encourages us to clean that place, to, to tidy up that place, make it presentable, make it attractive so that the, you know, if, if people do happen to wander in there, they'll be impressed by, by Muslim culture rather than being disgusted by, by this kind of um, uh, uh, bad hygiene. So anyway, so that, that's part of it as well. And in general, the sunnah, we're encouraged to follow the sunnah of the Prophet, and that's, that's really culture building. Developing a lifestyle that's in keeping with things that the Prophet used to do. Not in a rigid, kind of a mid medieval type of way, the way the Wahhabis will do it, right? But in a way that's meaningful, that looks at the, the spirit of that, that sunnah, and tries to extract what that spirit is, and then inject that spirit into our dealings as well, so that it's sort of help you and, and uh, livable reflection of the Prophet. So the point that is that Islam's relation to culture in part is negative, excludes some things from, from existing cultures, lets other things stay because they're Islamically compatible. Not Islamic, but Islamically compatible. And then it also injects certain things and shapes and molds that culture and adds things to it to give um, a Muslim a distinct quality that is different from other religions. That's part of culture as well. <laughs> How European are they now? 
Besides their name, the mech at the beginning of a name that tells you the guy's from Scotland, or the, I don't know, the, the, the ski at the end that tells you they're, tells you they're from Poland. Besides that, for the most part, there's very little left in, in them, in their, in their family culture, their, there's very left, little left of that foreign culture in them after sometimes one to two to five, six generations. So it's just a matter of time before everything that's foreign is lost Besides, at most, maybe our name, maybe our skin color, our hair color, these kinds of things. But other than that, nothing else is going to be left. <coughs> so now, if we um, tie Islam to that foreign culture, and we consider Islam to be part of our culture, then as that culture fades and eventually disappears, then Islam also fades and disappears from our current generation. So when Islam is just something that you happen to be, you're born into it, that's why you're Muslim, that's not going to be the same for your, your children and your grandchildren. So this is, this is one big, um, the big danger of um, enmeshing culture too closely with religion. That as culture disappears from coming generations, then Islam will also disappear. Another huge um, problem though is that this kind of Islam, cultural Islam, forms these huge barriers between the mingling of Muslims and then it forms a huge barrier to people who might be interested in Islam or converts to Islam who don't share in that foreign culture. Right, so we end up with these very cliquish type of Islamic centers, especially in the, Shia, in the uh, Shia communities of North America. The Sunnis are a little bit advanced because, I think partly because they started earlier. Right, back in the 50s, um, they had very large waves of immigrants from Arab countries and so forth, and they had MSAs and all this stuff. They have kind of um, assimilated and in, in healthy ways better. And so their massages are much more integrated, much more diverse, much more kind of relevant than Shia centers that, for the most part, pop, uh, popped up after the Islamic Revolution, right, which is in the, almost in the 80s. Right? So there's a 20 to 30 year lag between what the Sunni uh, communities have done and what the, the Shia communities are now doing. So hopefully it's a matter of time, but it's not just going to happen automatically, or at least it won't happen in a thoughtful way if it's automatic. And it'll take a long time and kind of will wander into some, some sort of thing, but we can take an active stance in actually doing something that's beneficial. But like what you end up with in Shia centers is very cliquish, culturally kind of uh, uh, um, sequestered and, and ghettoized societies where you have the Iranian cultural center and you have the, the Pakistani place that looks and then they look totally different. You walk in immediately, the smell is different, the, the carpet's different, the, the seating arrangement's different. In the Iranian place, you have chairs to sit on. In the Pakistani place, you have the carpet on the floor to sit on. Um, and and, and they're, for, for people for, to go from one to the other, it's just, it's like, it's, they feel like it's a, a shock. Like, how can you sit on the floor? How can you sit on chairs? That's sacrilegious, that's against the religion. That, those kinds of things, because they're not used to it. Simply because they have a habit, and now they walk into a mosque where there's another habit, they feel like this is somehow un -Islamic. How can you do uh, like a madam that way, standing up? How can you do a sitting down that's so disrespectful? How can you, you know, this and that, so little cultural things become like barriers then, and these huge walls that separate these different foreign elements. And even though they share a common belief, they can't, they can't come together, at least not usually in a, in a, in a happy sort of a way. But then, what, what, like that, the fire marshal I mentioned, and most converts have this sort of experience, um, that they feel now not only have they lost all their culture, their connections to their, their own culture, their Caucasian or, or African um, American culture, now when they come into the mosque, it's also a foreign culture. There's no Islam, there's no kind of American or Canadian Islam there either. It's, you have to become Iranian or Pakistani or they're Indian if you want to become Muslim. Right? So, creates a huge barrier for them. It's much easier for them to become Sunni than it is to become Shia. When they read, they, they say Shiism is definitely right. When they walk into Islamic Islamism, they say Shiism is definitely not right. The Sunnis are so much more welcoming. Everything's in English. There's already so much diversity. You don't have to convert to another, another culture. You can, you, there's a, lot of, a much better feeling of of brotherhood amongst various cultures and colors, these kinds of things, when you go into the Sunni centers, because they, for a different reasons, but that, that, is, that is really the reality. Okay, what are some solutions? So, the current, 
a good solution is not is not to simply uh, strip away foreign culture and somehow try to get back to this kind of Salafinist type of a dry um, common denominator type of Islam. That's artificial, undoable, um, uh, and and not healthy at all. There's one. Um, this reminds me of one uh, phrase from uh, Imam Ali's letter to Malik al Ashta. Right, in letter number 53 in Ashabala, Imam Ali, he's written this letter to his governor um, and really right hand man, Malik al Ashta, as he's sending him to Egypt. And so he says the following in that letter He says, um, Abolish no proper custom which has been acted upon by the leaders of his community, through which harmony has been strengthened and because of which the subjects have prospered. Create no new custom which might, in a way, detract from the customs of the past, lest their reward belong to him who originated them and the burden be upon you to the extent that you have abolished them. So the idea is don't, don't replace things, don't get rid of things. Actually, yeah, don't get rid of things unless you have something that's equal or better to replace it with. So for instance, um, we have a culture of uh, particular kind of uh, flavors of uh, commemoration for Imam Hussein, for instance, for Az Azadari. Um, so different cultures, it's a very emotional kind of a time, and different cultures have developed different ways of, of doing that. Different styles of poetry, different languages, different styles of, of uh, chess beating, and these kinds of things. And uh, um, to simply say, let's get rid of it all and come up with a new system, is first of all not doable, but it's also not healthy, it's not even ideal. Right? We don't want to get rid of something that has done, had a purpose, had a role to play, and can still continue to have a role to play, without first uh, replacing it with something that's as good at least, if not better, and more relevant. Right? It, it, it's an organic change, and it will, it will change organically. Um, uh, one indication that I have that's, that's promising is that if you notice, um, every year my, my wife and I kind of, we spend the first 10 days of Muharram kind of Googling and uh, going on YouTube and trying to find kind of new, new compositions of poetry and new styles of poetry. And I've, like, um, spoken word, for instance, is a new style of poetry that's kind of organically growing, coming up into uh, the, the Muslim world, and young people are are writing this kind of poetry that's that connects much better. I, I personally had this experience. experience. I, I went to, when I first came back from Iran. I went to this um, this camp. It was like a leadership uh, camp, and uh, I just wanted to kind of participate. Things, so I, I went to, as, a, as a participant and uh, kind of undercover, just to just to just to be part of it with all these um, young young people. And I remember there's this one um, young man, there's a convert, um, also from South Carolina, coincidentally where I'm from. And he, um, uh, he, was, he was known for writing poetry, so everyone kind of convinced him to read some of his poetry. So he read um, basically like a rap, a spoken word po poem, right, on Imam Hussein. And like, after like, three or four lines, this whole room of teenagers and 20-something year olds were in tears. The same people who, including myself, who could listen to hours of Urdu poetry or Farsi poetry or Arabic poetry or very clumsy kind of adaptations in English of, like basically translations of those things into English that, that are ugly and, and clumsy and have and be completely stoic and have no reaction at all. But this one poem that was written in a way that's relevant, culturally relevant to us and connected with us, it has such a great effect on us. Right? So that's that's now something like uh, the the first inkling that there is there is like a, a movement to try to create cultural elements that are um, ser kind of serving similar purposes, but now in a way that's relevant to, to us here. Or think of like these um, almost like kind of music music video adaptations of, of you know, these sorts of things. You've probably seen them on, on, on YouTube and stuff as well. So they'll have, people recite different kinds of poetry, and they'll, it's always like a music video, but it's, it's kind of Islamic. It shows you images of Karbala, these kinds of things, as the poetry is being recited. And so now you have an audiovisual element that's, again, relevant to us, because even like the non-Muslims and in the non-Muslim culture, we have music videos, these kinds of things that, that display something along with music, and that's something that we appreciate. So that in an Islamic context, that also becomes relevant and something that's appreciated. Right, so we have those kinds of things, but we should not kind of uh, uh, prematurely get rid of what's, what's there until we can replace it with something that's as good or, or better. But we should, I think, get rid of obvious barriers. There's some things that are obvious barriers that 
really prevent the, even, even the initial stages of interaction amongst these people who are from different cultures. Language, for instance. Maintaining a foreign language as a part of Islamic practice, I believe is completely uncalled for and wrong. If you want to maintain a foreign language because you have an interest and a value for that language, keep it separate, keep it out of Islam. You can have your cultural center, you can have your cultural events where you just you know, recite poetry and people can just speak their foreign language because maybe they enjoy that. But don't bring that into an Islamic context. Unless you're willing to face the consequences that your Islamic center, your, your mosque is going to be just a, an island, a bubble of isolation from the world. Nobody's going to come in because they're not welcome. And you're not really going to integrate either because you don't know how to integrate. If you're willing to accept that consequence, then go for it. But language, having a foreign language in this new world as part of Islam and part of like a vehicle for Islam, I think is a huge injustice to um, ourselves and then to other people who would otherwise be exposed to Islam. So that's an obvious barrier that needs to be gotten rid of. Um, uh, like other, a couple other examples I thought of were kind of obvious uh, obstacles besides language. One is um, offensive, sometimes you have culturally offensive things or things that are offensive to other people's tastes. So like uh, one example from like my heritage is hot food. Right, so one of the, one of the things we notice uh, in, in when cultures do come together with these foreign elements, when the Indians and Pakistanis cook, they cook hot food and spicy food that's not, it can't be tolerated by the people who are used to it. And that's something obviously offensive to people that's going to drive people away and make them feel like they're not welcome or they can't even enjoy uh, a nice meal with, with, with their, their brethren in faith because they can't, even, they can't even tolerate the food. That's something that should be immediately gotten rid of as a policy for a mosque, for instance, that we're not going to have foods that are, you can have cultural foods and ethnic foods, but they should be ethnic foods that are likable by the by the people. I don't know, hummus for instance, like it seems like universally everyone likes hummus, just to like, right? So it's, it is ethnic, but it's also something that's, that's likable by most people, not all people. Right, so you can have, that, that's something that I think should also be. It seems like it's just a trivial thing, but it becomes such a big thing when people are tied to their food. We have, we kind of, we cherish our own food. I remember I was in one center, <coughs> and, um, this Irani uh, brother, it was a predominantly, predominantly uh, sub subcontinent culture a center. This Irani brother, all his good intentions brought a big pot of Irani halib. Right? And he, he said, I brought, I brought halib. All the Indians were all excited that, oh, great, there's halib. Um, and when they ate it, they were disgusted by it because it was sweet. They're like, it's meat and wheat, and it has sugar and cinnamon in it. This is so weird. And they thought he made a mistake because of Ramadan. They thought maybe he put sugar instead of salt. They took the whole thing and dumped it out in the garbage can. They thought it was, it was inedible because it's all, it's all been messed up. So like, it becomes a huge offense to that person who shows great insensitivity on the part of these people just because they, 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 they didn't realize that Halim in the Indian context is hot and spicy and salty and Halim in the Iranian context is cinnamony and sugary and tastes totally different. And Arab Halim is totally different. Ali but Hadith, Allah is totally different, he's also Hadith. <laughs> right? um, so a small thing, a trivial thing can become a big thing because if it offends someone, it drives someone away, all of a sudden it puts a wedge in the community that's, that's sometimes irreparable. Um, Alright, another two more solutions. One is um, as Muslims we should we need to reconnect with Islam in a very authentic way. Right? Because as long as we practice Islam and believe in Islam simply because this is the way it's been passed down to us, the way it's been received, then we still have that, those cultural elements and we don't know what the distinction is, where Islam ends and where culture begins. It's only when we revisit Islam and start to learn about it in an authentic way that we start to realize what are actually the halal and haram. What are the red lines of Islam? Where does Islam, what is actually Islamic? And then where does the culture, where do my cultural elements start? Then I can compromise properly, and I know that okay on these elements that are cultural, I'm, I'm, I'm totally willing to compromise. If this is offensive to you, let's get rid of it. If you like it, let's practice it, just because it's, it's, it's something we can kind of make as our, our part of our new culture. But I, I know it's dispensable. 
Whereas these things that are, are Islamic, right, they, they, I can't compromise on those. Right? So re reconnecting in an authentic way with Islamic beliefs and practices is going to be a necessary step in then being able to intelligently, wisely um, navigate through these, uh, this uh, process of getting rid of harmful culture and then developing a new Islamic culture in, in the West. And the last thing I think is to engage um, in a meaningful way and a sensitive way with each other uh, despite our cultural differences. Right, so we, we don't necessarily have so much appreciation, or as I'm saying it very kindly, we don't have much appreciation for um, other people's flavors of Islam. So the, the example I just gave where people might even just dis dismiss another culture, right? Um, instead, realize that, okay, I have certain, you know, subcontinent related cultural elements. You have some Irani or Arab or um, Caucasian American, Black American, uh, Canadian type of um, elements. That's fine. We can still, we can interact and we can, you know, I can find out about your stuff and I can even, you know, enjoy your food and enjoy your different cultural elements and you can reciprocate. And through that process, we'll um, get to know each other. We will also start the process and speed up the process of filtering out those things that are not really useful and not very beneficial and don't really fit with the community and those things that are. Because it could be that, for instance, um, there are certain elements in Iranian culture that would really fit well even in the Western context and other things that wouldn't. And some things from the, the um, Indian Pakistani culture that would also fit very well. So we can start to pick and choose those things that will eventually feed into this new Canadian or American Islamic culture through this process of interaction and that kind of organic process of um, uh, interacting and then choosing and dis discarding uh, that, that happens organically when you interact. One of the, um, the, the necessary steps for this kind of interaction to happen though is that we have to interact in a way that's humble and not chauvinistic. And this is something I've had a personal uh, struggle with. Um, it's one time, if I, if I come to you and I have certain cultural practices and I and I uh, am I'm humble in the way I present them to you. And I say, you know, for instance, I have uh, certain kinds of food that I like to share with you. And I say, you know, I'd like to cook a meal for you, and you know, I, I hope you'll enjoy enjoy this meal. And I'm very humble and very kind of positive about it. And that that gives one impression. There's another time when I just assume that my food's the best, and you, know, you, you, you obviously should like it. Let me just, let me give it to you, and and just assume if you don't like it, that's your problem. And I have this kind of arrogant and chauvinistic attitude towards my culture, right? Naturally, I don't know what the psychology is about it, but naturally, if I, and even in personal relations, if I come to you as a humble person and say, for instance, you know, here's a book that I've written, uh, I, I hope I hope it's beneficial to you, then it give, you, you have one, you approach the book with one one impression. If I come to you and say, this is the best book written, my my, my writing skills are excellent, and, and this is, you probably never read, read a book as good as this then immediately your interaction, your reaction to the book will be either to just discard it because I'm arrogant, or you'll be looking for faults and you'll be, you'll, you'll be clued into finding, finding out how wrong I was and thinking I was so good when actually I'm not really that good. Right, so naturally, as soon as you, it, it's in a hadith as well, if you push yourself up, then, then Allah pushes you down. And if you, if you come humbly, then He lifts you up. Right? And the same thing happens, I think, in human psyche as well. So in our culture, our, react, our interactions with one another, if we are humble in our interactions with people, then the, the outcome ends up being much, much better. Let me, let me stop there and, and take um, questions. If you don't mind, uh, we were thinking of like, making a circle to we get to know other people. Actually, it was kind of fun. Uh, yeah, so what we're going to do is... You have fun to open this question. Yeah, so we're going to do so three things. Firstly, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, so, first we're going to open the floor for you know, questions and answers. Uh, we're also going to be taking uh, all those people who are interested in the books uh, which you have over with them. Uh, yeah, we're also taking all this through Facebook. So, if you still want more time to think about it, let's go to that. And finally, we'll have uh, some small refreshments uh, at the end of the room, just some biscuits. And my suggestion would have contribution to your clients. Well, you were planning on going around, right? Not just going around, but people who can see each other. Whoever asked, like, okay, I was thinking, well, I'm going to be in the same space.
The best recommendation in that it was not an emphasis on culture or culturally oriented speech, but it was more based on the Islamic uh, content. Uh, they say that, okay, be humble, be open to new experiences, offer it to others, and look at their feedback. I think the same thing is for the culture, too. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm an organizational research. In organizational research, the literature in 1980 was looking at the organizational culture as something like organizational culture or group culture as something like it has to be integrated within the organization. We have to have one culture within all departments, all the floors, and that's going to continue in the first performance of the organization. In 10 years, it was created the way. So more they're looking at the culture as more differentiation. Okay, this department has this culture, this department has this culture. They have to work with each other, they have conflict, but we can resolve it and so forth. But then they realize that the culture, you can't resolve, there's no, there's no no conflict situation. Conflict is a part of the communication, it's a part of the collaboration. If you collaborate with another center, for sure there's going to be conflict. I have been raised in another culture, in another country, in another situation compared to someone else in another part of the world. So again, it doesn't work that we aim for minimizing the conflict, maybe solutions by forget about all the cultures you have, but this is the three things that we have to have, stick in Islamic culture, whatever you call it, and then it's going to improve the performance, whatever it's going to be performance, whatever it would uh, have a lot of the community. Now it's more of the fragmentation. They call it this, this uh, metaphor of, uh, it's like um, jungle. It's not clear, but we have to work with each other, collaborate with each other, and it's more of the learning by doing. We have to interact, our centers have to interact, and we see based on the, 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 the principles that we said, we have to be humble, we have to, those, those rules that are, those are Islam. So I'm kind of, was not sure I understood the examples you were making. In, it's eight years I've been here in, my, in Montreal, before I was in Iran. But in the eight years that I have been here, I have seen many centers. I have never felt offended of having a spicy food, and nobody has no spicy food. I was just smiling and still, that's cool. Here is where everything is spicy. I have to add some flavor to it, or I'm going to eat at home. But what I love is that I see new brothers. So I was not ever pushed back from that, that, that center because the food was spicy. I was not there for food, honestly. Or because that everybody is sitting on the ground or sitting on the chair. I was not having the perception that, OK, because people are sitting on the chair, maybe this is Islamic. Or no, and it's, it's Iranian Islamic people sit on the group part. I don't think those examples are really contributing to the main point that we're making. I think culture is a part of the people. It helps better understanding uh, the communication that they have and so forth. We can never forget about it and get rid of it. I mean, you can't fight with that, but I'm not sure it's going to work. But what we need to emphasize is that, okay, we have different centers. The different people have want to preserve their culture, just like the Canadians. We have a lot of immigration in Canada. They're coming from different countries. Canada never say that, okay, if you want to be embarrassed here, welcome here, forget about the culture. They always respect your culture. They say that, okay, keep it, or try to integrate. So we can't have something like this. We can't preserve Iranian. We can't preserve Pakistan. Whatever culture we have, we don't need to get rid of it. Because I need my son to be able to communicate with my mom. It's Salatul Rahim, which is a wajib. And if I get forget about the language and so forth, he can communicate. And I see those type. My uncle, for example, has been here for 40, 50 years. And their children is not able to communicate with my grandma and that except hi, and that's it. And now they are died and they have no experience of who they were. So culture is a part of us. So we can't get rid of it. We need to emphasize how we can collaborate, how we can go to the, each other's centers, how each center can advertise the programs of other centers and, and, and encourage everyone. This is the culture we have, but let's go and let's see other brothers in other cultures. Let's learn from them. You're not the best. We have a lot of things that we need to improve, but we have good things that we can offer to others too. If you go back to Islam, for example, Rasulullah, some part of it is really cultural. It's Arabic. No one can say that Quran in English is going to be just like, uh, I mean, let's change the Quran to English. Let's pray in English. No. The Salat should be in Arabic. 
So part of the culture is embedded in Islam, is respected in Islam. And for example, I don't remember when I was reading that, but I was reading a book from Shaykh Mutahri, and he was saying that Islam has no problem with the culture unless it's against the principle of Islam. So if you go to a culture, and that was his example, if they stand up and eat, they stand up and eat with them and enjoy it. So we need to emphasize those type of tolerance, welcoming, and those type of things, which is coming from Islam, not trying to just push the culture down, which we're not, I'm not sure it's going to work. I mean, we can't do it. But that's my perception. So that was the reason I would come back, to which I really like the last one, which I think it's going to work, compared to the others that are, I'm not sure they are practical. Uh, solutions to really to build the uh, offense. I, I don't know what you, what you heard, but that's not what I, I actually negated that explicitly in that. We shouldn't replace and get rid of culture. That's not the solution. I said that explicitly too, so you're just you're echoing the same thing I said. But the examples that you were making, I think, was not too many. I, I saw and, and those are anecdotal, that, but you're anecdotally saying that you personally don't feel that way. You, you, you feel like you can you can navigate in, in various cultures. My, my point is, First of all, why do we even have um, ethnically segregated communities? That is one problem. And the second is that the, first the vast majority, at least people that I interact with, the people that I, I get feedback from, um, who are quite a, a wide range of people, especially converts, right? They seem to have a very different experience. And it's hard, much harder for them to come in and say, or they might be able to tolerate and say, you know, okay, I can, I can put up with, with these different cultures that are foreign to me to some extent, but there's a time when it comes, um, especially when there's a dichotomy made by, by people where they'll say, for instance, a common phrase that I hear that converts tend to be very sensitive to is where people will say, for instance, not, that's not the Islamic way of doing it, that's the American way of doing it. Or and Muslims, we don't do that, oh, that's, Ameri Amer that's American, like American culture. As though Amer being American and being Islamic is totally different. Because they, uh, that person who's speaking is equating being Iranian with being Muslim, now they can say this is not Islamic, it's American. So for the American Muslim, that becomes a very offensive thing. Because now you're basically saying you can't be American and be Muslim. You need to give up being American and be Iranian to be a proper Muslim, or be Arab and then you can be a proper Muslim. So that kind of a thing can be, and it is often very offensive and very exclusionary to people who maybe don't come in with a very strong identity to begin with, and then an attitude of, of wanting to tolerate and wanting to kind of get along with other people. I haven't seen the, I mean, you've got the two examples. You say why we have different centers, because we have different cultures. But if, do you mean that we have to have another center that's English and welcoming to all? For sure, we can't have it. But do you have the recommend, that? That's where the, I, I had that perception that, okay, if the centers are not position based on the culture, what's going to be the next, what, what is your plan? Is it going to be one center in English, multiple in English, uh, Canadian American type of thing? So at, very, at very least, the, the culture, the centers that are, maybe have been formed by a particular group of people who have share some values, at very least they should have the foresight to say, we need to get to a place where our people and our Islam and our Islamic practice is somehow better integrated with society. So let's have a solid direct movement in that direction. So for instance, um, instead of simply um, keeping everything in a foreign language and doing everything in a particular way that's basically just transplanted from a foreign land into here and keeping that for 20 and 30 and 40 years, which is often the case, right? Start with that to make people feel make the people who are the founders and the, the initial people, um, make them feel comfortable, but then as leaders kind of push, push that society into a direction where they're more and more integrated, more and more open to other people, more and more inviting to the, to converts and people from the outside and that, that kind of thing. So there's direction in a positive, in a positive way. So I thank you so thank you. Um, so yeah, I have a question concerning uh, interpretation. So you were criticizing, uh, you know, the kind of more let's say literalist Sunni uh, tradition that wants to go back to the Hadith and say, okay, this is exactly how we should practice it, right? So my question is, um, if you if you're kind of rejecting this, or at least saying you know we should interpret, we should keep the spirit, right, but adapt it for our times in a sense, then on a theoretical level, what objectively remains Islamic, and what is subject to interpretation, and how does this interpretation even happen? Yeah, <clears throat> this is part of ijtihad. 
right? This is it's not it's not a kind of a, an easy process or a subjective process that I as an individual should, should undertake. But this is part of part of ijtihad, and, and the role the role of the mujtahid is to be that interpreter who interprets not based on kind of cultural tastes and personal tastes, but based on a methodology, right? And so, for, like, for instance, with clothing, instead of saying, like, if the Prophet wore um, pants that were high, we have a hadith to say that. That it was the sunnah of the Prophet to wear pants that were high, not all the way to the ground, the way you see Wahhabis wear, uh, wear their pants now. But when you ask our mujtahids, um, is that still the sunnah, they'll say, no, for one thing, it's now become a, a characteristic and a sign of Wahhabis, and so now it's, now it's no longer um, acceptable for a Shiri man to wear pants like that because everyone will associate him with Wahhabis and, and like, those kinds of uh, Sunnis. That's one thing, and secondly, it's like, there. There were particular like hygiene issues, for instance, in that time. That's what, why the Prophet would wear high, high pants. They were barefoot for the most part. They didn't wear shoes, and everything's dirty. It's not paved and stuff like that. So if you had shorter clothes, they wouldn't get dirty. So there's like, they they understand that those are certain. Those are the issues that are applicable. The spirit is to have clothes, clean clothes um, that, that aren't you know, and the, that's that's the spirit. So they they, they bring that into our our. Um, Islamic laws as well. So yeah, it's the job of a, of a mujtahid, so that's methodo methodologically sound, not arbitrary. Uh, one, one other, sorry, one other comment to Yasser's point as well. Um, so the la foreign language and those kinds of things, I understand that there's value to it. That's, I'm not even discounting that. I'm simply saying don't tie it to Islam. Don't make, don't, like oftentimes what I see is that um, uh, immigrants, they want the Islamic center to be the bastion of promoting and maintaining their foreign language. They want to make sure that their, their children learn or are or, or connected to their foreign language, and so they insist that all the lectures in the center be in Urdu or part Persian or whatever. Right? What they're doing, first of all, the kids don't even understand because usually the language of the ulama is much harder than what kids can understand from their conversations at home and stuff like that. And secondly, now you, you're, you, you create a huge barrier. Now, nobody except for the people who speak that language can even benefit. And so automatically you're excluding a whole swath of people, both Muslims and potential converts or, or converts. That's, so don't tie it to Islam. Have your cultural practices separate. Have your a meal once a week, everyone's speaking for the Farsi. That's per perfectly fine, great. Um, teach your own kids. Have your, your Persian schools, not Islamic school. Like have your Persian school separate and your Islamic school separate. That's, that's what I'm saying. That makes sense. That, that makes sense. I thought that you were talking about all centers, and you said, "Well, it's culturally different." But it, it's a good recommendation, a workable one. That we have these policies within centers that we have to have one or two English one, Farsi one, or the Urdu one, or the one. But uh, that makes sense. Yes. Uh, to, to support this point um, about the center and the the, the language, uh, I had the opportunity to get to a Muslim center in Montreal. Uh, where all the very, um, you know, the, the like the proper Islamic sayings were said in Arabic, but all the speech and was said in mix of French and English, and it was very interesting. There weren't that many people in the room, but we probably were about thirty of us, and there were at least half like observants, like like me, you know, and we just came, and it was, uh, and like there, there would have been no other way for us to come and get any other message hadn't it been in English and French. And afterwards there was like this uh, this meal and like it was it was Arabic food. We ate like on the floor, like you know, but and that was that was part of like that was part of the experience. You know, like I think there's like different things. There's like you, you have to let observers pick into the because the thing is kind of, it ties back in like this, you know, like part of Islam is also cultural. So I think like people that are Attracted to Islam, are also attracted by the culture in general. You know, it's a it's a whole thing. So I think you have to make the culture understandable, but but yeah, like understandable is is key. Not 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 solely just get rid of it because it's also what draws people. You know, so yeah. But you don't know, find it strange, like say say if you if you were to convert into Islam and then you you felt like you had to give up your own your own practices and suddenly. Start, like, for instance, you, you felt like you had to sit on the floor now. When, but that, that happens to be something that's also part of the sunnah, to sit on the floor. So that, yeah. that actually is part of the part of Islamic culture. Or eating with your hands but is actually part of Islamic them? culture. How do you choose what, what you keep, what you, like, what you remove? Uh, 
because yeah, as you as you're saying, sitting on the floor might be offensive to to me, for example, as a Westerner, you know. Uh, but if it's part of the sunnah, can you have a right to get rid of it? Or no, no. So if it's part of the sunnah, that happens to be an example where it's actually part of the sunnah too. But like, um, um, like eating with eating with hands, for instance, that's also mm -hmm. part of the sunnah. It's a recommendation to eat with your hands. For Iranis, that's very weird. In Iran, I'd go, I'd, I'd be invited someplace, and I'd eat with my hands, and they think I was some sort of a barbarian. <laughs> for them. Because Islam is just cultural for the people. And these are actually religious people too who actually knew the Sunnah, but it was they're so distanced from this, from actually practicing the Sunnah that they didn't even they thought I was being offensive by eating my hands. But like personally in my like in my household we decided that we want to sit on the floor not because of cultural things. Like growing up we always sat on the tables and stuff like that. Because we're very much integrated with American culture. But we decided let's, let's go back because there are high high recommendations for sitting on the floor. Let's not have a, a, a dining table, let's sit on the floor. So we've chosen to do that because it's an Islamic uh, thing. Or we choose to eat with our hands, um, but if guests come over, we'll offer them utensils as well and say you're free to eat with utensils. Um, but we choose to eat with our hands. And if we go to other, if I go outside, I'll eat with utensils because it may not it doesn't look nice to other people. But like, I understand like you can't just arbitrarily get rid of things, and that's that's not ideal either. But at least if we're sensitive, I think like also echo if we're sensitive to the fact that culture can be hard for people to stomach. Um, and make it understandable, like those are those are good recommendations as well. You explain why you're doing something that you know, Lebanese culture says that we, that we do this, that's why we're doing this. Or no, Islamically, this is some value that we have, and this is why we're practicing this. Just a quick interruption. I'm gonna circulate the box. Maybe you can introduce them first while people are talking, they can take a walk. Some people are new, some people are So I brought, a, I brought a sample of some of the books that I've worked on. Um, this, is the, this is the latest book, um, it's called God's Emissaries, uh, Adam to Jesus. So this is a, it's, a, it's stories of the prophets um, written for an adult audience. It's, it's, to my knowledge, it's the most comprehensive um, book like this that we have right now. Um, um, and it, it kind of, it brings together all the information we have on the prophets um, in a way that's uh, theologically sound, in a way that, um, um, is textually accurate um, and also believable. So it's like, it, it, for, for me, it's, it's something that I always wanted to see because oftentimes we have, like the Quran presents the prophets in kind of bits and pieces here and there, never really giving us a narrative besides chapter 12, which tells us the story of Surah Yusuf all in one go. But generally, it's, just, it's like a, a puzzle of, of, of things. So we kind of put the whole puzzle together and, and interpret it in a way. Um, so that's, that, that's one, one book. Um, this is, a, um, this is a textbook on, on Tajweed that I wrote a couple years ago. Um, kind of the results of my own struggle to learn Tajweed and then to kind of, uh, kind of present it in a way that I thought was more um, intuitive and more uh, accessible to people. So this is, this is a textbook that's often used in Sunday schools and I also use it as a teaching tool for my classes. And then these three are, um, these are from the Islamic Text Institute, which is an organization I, I started with some of my teachers from the seminary. So uh, this is what Yusuf was also mentioning in the beginning, um, al -Kafi. Um So the work here, this, this is, is to does is to take uh, Islamic primary sources, Shiri primary sources, and um, uh, uh, go through a process to write commentary that kind of uh, preempts the kinds of questions and doubts that a Western audience would have when they encounter these texts, and to try to contextualize those texts with um, Islamic teachings as a whole. And then if needed, some of our texts are also contradictory to the Quran or contradictory to Islamic teachings, that's also reject them and say why this particular hadith is false and how it can't be compatible with some sort of work. But to give that sort of a um, uh, connect, um, uh, contextualization to a hadith through commentary. So we, we write the commentary and then it's all translated to English. In a way, the audience for these books, actually all my books are just uh, people who don't necessarily have uh, technical knowledge, they don't have Arabic uh, background, these kinds of things, but they are intelligent, curious people. Um, that's, that's kind of the, the mindset that we have in mind when we're writing, writing the books. So this is, uh, these are two, two books on uh, on Kafi out of um, eight that will eventually be in the series of Shabbat. And then, um, and this is a, a du'a called Du'a Nunta, um, also with commentary and, and translation. Hey, I I just uh, I was thinking maybe maybe you are think we are talking about the thing that had happened before in the seventh century that we are doing that, that we are writing.
writing the same question in the 21st century. And that's the question of Islam starting spreading in new land. For example, when the Arabs and the Muslims in the uh, 7th century conquered all the 8th century. 8th century, yeah. All the non-Muslim countries, the first thing, for exception of Iran or some other country, they did they change the language of the people. So we have now we have the Arabic speaking people in the Egypt, in the Lebanon, in the Iraq. They were not people who originally spoke Arabic. So the, this calling them cultural thing tied with the Islamic and the, the Umayyad, they imposed their culture on the people. And they had the resistance of some people like Iranians giving their own land. Despite the fact that Persian totally changed, but at least they keep the main principles of the language. So now we have the same thing in the Western country, in, in, for example, in Canada. The thing that I'm feeling is that, the, that this conflict between the first generation of the immigrants and the people who want to be here and stay here. The reality of the Western countries, countries like Canada who accept immigrants, is that they have put the, they have designed this immigration thing that after one, or at least two, at least two generations, if you are staying here, your children won't remember, they don't, they can't speak any word in Persian. And nothing, they cannot connect themselves to Persian culture, and we call it culture. So the first thing we should decide, I think is resistance of keeping the language among the people who want to go back to Iran. To speak of this, and look at it this, this from the Iranian perspective. The whole wave of Iranian immigrants we had in the 10, 20 years ago of the students, Iranian students who came here, they were, they were very active, and they all now, most of them are back to Iran. Because when you have this perspective on your future, if you're thinking that, okay, I'm going to go back to Iran in 10 or 20 years, so like Yasser, I'm very sensitive of keeping my language, Persian language for my kids, but it's totally different for people who come here and they don't want to go back to Iran, they're planning to stay here forever. So there is no maybe there is no need to keep Persian and to insist on the learn, teaching the children children their mother's tongue if they want to stay here. So I think that we are mixing these two and this uh, kind of mixture of this we, we have to define we have to re-question our first issue to see what we are thinking what we are talking about. We are, are we talking about the people who are coming here to stay here forever? Good. Or we are talking about the students, like me, who are coming here, they want to go back after seven, eight years and they are finished with their studies. Yeah. So it's totally different. Thing. And the question of the converts is, again, another thing. For the Iranians who are coming here as students and they want to go back, honestly, the, if the converts are not welcome, then it's another issue. Okay, I'm, I'm coming here, I just want to keep my faith for myself, for my kids, and uh, go back to Iran in eight years, that's it. So if the converts are not welcome in our center, or they are welcome, uh... Yeah, that's a good point. I, I personally don't, um, I personally, I, I don't even think about people like that. And I'm not, maybe that's, a, uh, that's the wrong attitude to come into with this in this gallery, because it looks like many of you are in that category. Uh, so maybe that's my own misunderstanding. No, no, I'm saying that these are. are the people that they, yeah. they might be... In, uh, no, I understand. Um, but I, I'm not even, like in my talk, in, in my thinking, I don't even consider people who are not here permanently. I'm thinking of people who are, who are here permanently. So maybe that was the wrong, even the wrong talk to have with this audience. I just saw several of you, maybe half of you, or less than half of you are like that. You're just here temporarily. But what do you say about people, like, I lived in Dearborn for seven years. There are people who have been there since the early 1900s. They came over when Henry Ford was in his heyday in the Ford factory. And now four or five generations, six generations afterwards, they still speak with a strong, they can speak English with an accent. They still insist on speaking Arabic. Um, and they don't interact at all with, with, with non-Muslim, non-Arab, not non-Muslim, non-Arabs. Right, and being, I, us, like my, my daughter in, in public school, usually if you have the problem in public schools where being, being the, you know, you're the one odd Muslim and the one odd hijabi out there, she had, like, the vast majority of the public schools there are, are Muslim, Arab, and uh, an Arab boy came up to her and said, why are you wearing hijab? And she said, I'm Muslim. He said, you can't be Muslim, you're Indian. 
This is an Arab, a Muslim, Muslim boy telling her this. Right? That's characteristic. Our next door neighbor, she comes over to play, play, um, play with our, our kids. And we, um, it was on Eid day, on one, one of the Eids. So I said, my, my kids can't come, come out to play um, because we're, we're, we're busy uh, commemorating something about Eid. And she's like, um, and then she kind of looked puzzled. So I said, do you know what Eid is? She said, yeah, it's an Arab holiday. Right, so like, that's five, six generations after. So that's, it's not only a problem of, like, there's some people who are so entrenched in culture that they, they don't give it up, that they become, that just becomes part of their, their ghettoized culture. Oh, sorry, the other, the other point um, you mentioned, so there, there's a huge difference in one aspect between the Islamic expansion, imperial expansion of the days and now. We're not, there's no kind of conquering of Canada. As far as I know, let's see how something planned for next week. Next week. <laughs> no, I'm but it's, 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 this is a more exactly. organic kind of infiltration where we're just coming for other reasons. Whereas there, you have the powers of government and mil military conquering a land and then being able to now make the call to impose language, religion, and so forth, um, and sponsor, you know, have a state sponsored kind of religious movement. Yeah, and I'll the main between these two was in terms of the language. If you want to put language as a part of your Islamic culture, or you want to make it separate and give them the bond. Many Iranians, Islamic culture is tied to the Persian language because the whole literature you have to teach the kids about the Islam, 90% of them are living in Persia. So you have the poetry, you have the books, you have, for example, the Shaykh Mutari book, they're almost all in Persia. So it's unimaginably connected and it's great. To be that's that's one perspective. I'm just saying that's more bad I have a question about she's asking the way that I was gonna say louder. Just speak louder so we're uh how about don't offend me, but I think the way you guys as a scholars dress is kind of uh with with the other exactly. So I you see it. Yeah, I thought I actually thought of that I was I was thinking about this this talk. Um I, I really don't like it. It's a, this is a, like, this, this garb is kind of a, it's kind of a, um, a necessary evil in my mind. Where, if I, if I come in plain clothes um, into, a, into a, a place where there's Shias, if I go into the Islamic Center as a, as a speaker wearing plain clothes, then um, I'm treated completely different, differently. I'm not, people don't think I have um, knowledge, they don't give, like, at least like, until I speak, they won't, they won't pay any attention. Right, so it's kind of a uniform, like, I mean, that's the way I justify it. It's kind of a uniform, the way a police officer wears a uniform, so that people can recognize that this person is a person of, with authority. Um, or even like in, in some of the other uh, religious traditions, um, in the Catholic Church, they have special garb, the Anglican Church, they have special garb that they wear. So it's something like that. That's the only way I can justify I personally, I don't wear this much. I only wear it when I'm kind of unofficial, I'm speaking actually, or leading a prayer, like where's some place where people expect that of me. Whereas, in general, I, I, I try not to wear it at all. Do you, you think it's an Islamic, driven culture or something like that? It's not, it's just a... I don't know, I don't have a, a good solution for how, how to, to get around it, and so I, I've given in to this particular thing. Um, but yes, it's, it's very, like, it doesn't fit in, it doesn't, it, it's not, it doesn't, it's not conducive to integration. Um, but I, don't, I haven't found any other, any other way to get around, around this. Especially other scholars who do wear this, like they see me without this, or they, they see me wear it sometimes, not wear it sometimes. Their perception is generally that you're not really a scholar, or you're kind of a, a half, a half-hearted scholar, these kinds of things. Like it's kind of like knowledge is somehow in the in the imam. If I untie the imam or cast it off, my knowledge goes with it. So, like, <laughs> that's I mean that's that's the way people deal with the, the dress. Because I've kind of seen something that is unnecessary. Not so welcoming, even if you want to go and be over that, and so like, distinct from other people around yeah. that, and they yet be you know, consistent people. Yeah. Uh, I don't have, I'm not happy with yeah, yeah, that. Yeah. So, like, like personally, like, if, I, if I'm going to go speak to, to converts or people who are just interested in Islam, I won't wear it. Um, or, I don't know, so I, I, it's, it's hard to kind of navigate, but it's, it is a challenge. Uh, probably I was not, I didn't live here as long as Yasser, but I've been to different communities, and 
I think they have good input for, for this crowd. Uh, I agree that certain streams of like Muslims or immigrants, they want to be here temporarily. Some of them are not willing to mix. It's their decision. At the same time, uh, if they can bring something uh, to Western audience or communities, as someone who was trained, who was educated uh, <coughs> with like good Islamic backgrounds, uh, and they don't do it, uh, maybe that's a little un-Islamic. It needs a lot of effort. It's really hard to mix and mingle with people of other cultures, but and it's probably not possible to do it like in the course of like two three years. But if they are having plans to uh, stay for like considerable interval, it's really good to consider this. Like they have a role to play uh, and bring things to people who are not raised in the same culture, with the same religion. Uh, and through these collision of cultures, even uh, understanding of Islam can evolve. That was one point. The other point was like people who care about uh, mixing and blending and uh, having Islam without uh, emphasis on culture. I think we need to think about it more. I've been to the like Iranian or Iraqi communities who want to address people from other ethnicities or converts and they're having a hard time. The other communities uh, with the core of like people who were raised in the West and they bring their own culture actually to the community. They do charities, they do community works like uh, West Wash Way and sometimes you just uh, explore their activities and you see a little left for Islam. It's just whatever they had with a good cover that is very beautiful to Western audience. Um, I don't know, I found sometimes in the core of community there should be a mix of both. Uh, and it's really hard, I don't know if it's even possible, uh, but I think they can bring something to this community, the people who are, uh, uh, who are new to Islam or who were raised in the West, and people who are coming from a different culture, and then they can separate like the downsides of their cultures, the parts that are purely, purely cultural, not Islamic, and then get better understanding of Islam. I don't know, this is just my personal idea. Yeah, that, that's the end. My, my final point was just that. But that can only happen if um, if both sides are willing to admit that their culture is not supreme. But typically what happens, typically the dynamic is the the foreigners who have a longer history of Islam with their culture, they feel like that's dominance. And then the converts should get rid of everything and they should adopt our, this foreign culture, because this is Islamic culture. And it's, it's not always the case. Sometimes, I'm telling you, like people from like Middle East are not that welcome in the communities that are completely like raising West people. Uh, I think it's really hard because when you're in one culture, you don't see what is not very favor favorable for the people of other culture. Uh, when you come to our communities, for example, you don't see why you uh, get offended. It's not just food sometimes. Lots of other things. Uh, the way people welcome each other. Uh, but I think it's a both a two-way street. so many languages, and it has been impacted by so many different civilizations. 
So even the blend at the end of the actual uh, German identity right now is a mix of French, of uh, Barbar, of many type of identities. Now the one thing, because Algeria, as you might know, was uh, colonized for more than 100 years by French. And French was imposed on people, and they were people, they were deprived from uh, teaching, uh, the teachings of Islamic studies and Arabic in the same time. So the only thing that people had the opportunity, because they were in a, in a situation of circumstances, they didn't have a chance to express themselves, because they were in a regime and a colonialism that didn't give them the ability to express their true identity. The only identity how it happened, it happened through Islam, because Islam protected the both culture and the also, also Islam, uh, the language and the Islam, Islamic perspective. People used to, like after school, let's say, of the French, they used to go study like, the Arabic language through Quran. So this is how the religion was maintained. And also the family took also the impact of trying, from like, let's say, the grandmother or grandfather, trying to sort of spread the, also the, uh, the cultural perspective. No. What matters for me, what I see, because now, uh, uh, as the Algerian language itself, there is so many uh, words that they are not even completely not Arabic at all. You might say French, Spanish, Berber, uh, Turkish, and it's unbelievable. It's all one language. But when you can, when it comes to the mosque, Alhamdulillah, subhanAllah, everyone, even though they speak also different languages, and they speak also the Algerian at the same time, they all understand Arabic when it comes to the, the Islam, uh, Islamic perspective. However, there is also the uh, cultural identity where people celebrate, you have the Barbar of the Kabir, they have their uh, way of uh, making certain ceremonies, you have the Tuareg down south, they have their own perspective, and they have the, also their own interpretation of Islam from their cultural background. And this is sometimes it can be also difficult. Is it, is it Islamic or not? Is it really has a greater impact? I think as we are, as all Canadians sometimes we are, uh, it's great to have both because sometimes you really want to make people taste, first of all, uh, your culture or your identity. Sometimes it comes to food. It's Iranian food, that is uh, uh, Persian food, that is, uh, I mean, uh, Algerian, Arabic, Moroccan, Iraqis. So there is your, the cultural perspective that is there, but also at the same time, that, that culture has been purified by Islam. So Islam has a greater impact. And we think both of them it works hand in hand. But to deny one from another or being just exclusive, I think it's going to create a limitation. And it's not going to allow people to taste the flavor of the, uh, uh, the Islam in general. Because Islam welcomes everything as long as it's halal. And this is what matters. But I think when it comes to language, it is important. But I think being segregated in one center or not to open the door for the other, and this is where it becomes very problematic, and we fell into the project that we forget in the sense of being. Good question. <clears throat> I'm French, I mean, I'm from a French culture, and in France, it, culture is very un-Islamic, I mean, let's just put it straight up. Like, if I was to Islamize French culture, it wouldn't even be French culture anymore. It would be something that, that you don't even, like when I'm in France, okay, and I'm with my French friends, I can't, I can't do most of what they do, okay? That just makes me not French in their eyes, and even in my eyes, I don't feel French in many, many respects because of that. So, in the way, I mean, you know, like there's gender mixing in a way that's not permitted in Islam. There's all these different activities, even when it comes to uh, holidays, things like that. The, way, the food you eat, everything, everything includes honest, completely un-Islamic things because the norms are different and everything is seen differently, right? Even the way you greet is un-Islamic in France, in France, right? So my question is, like, what, what, what would someone living in this kind of a situation? I mean, this is you can extend this even to you know other uh, European cultures. Uh, German culture, for example, is similar in that sense. What are we to do? Are we just to kind of become a, a, adults? I mean, this is a big problem in, in France because a lot of the Muslims who live there, right? They're accused of, you know, imposing their culture and this and that. I mean, we already had this discussion together, but just on a, on a broader scale, you're saying that we should, you know, adopt uh, a different culture. But when it's a culture like this that is, you know, so different that, you know, kind of using your cookie cutter in a sense would just leave leave us with nothing, pretty much. Uh, what, what do you think about this situation? 
the legal the legal ruling if it's unpract if uh, Islam is unpracticable in a particular place, right. then it's hijra. Right. The, the the Quran, the Quran, uh, the angels ask this person who feels like I had no choice and this is where I lived, and the response is Alam takun al Right. Earth is like right, but I mean it's not just about living in France. I mean I I don't live in France anymore. It's about even you know whether I like it or not. I mean my my, my half of my family is French. You know and I can't just you know give up. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I still have this identity. So to the extent that you can, and, uh, it might be hard. And to the extent that you can live there and maintain Islamic values and things, then you have to do that, or you can you can do that. But if you if it becomes unlivable, then then Hitra is the only option. So either you can influence, if you can influence society at whatever level, then you do that. If you can't, if you're being influenced yourself, then. Can I just reflect on Jawad's point in that I think 100% I agree with you. In that I think the point is, it's obviously focusing and orienting everything around language and culture is obviously failed. We're Muslim and then we have our culture. So it's culture is something that contributes to our religion and based on the situation that we were before. So that's obvious. I was trying to make the point that coming to the other side of the extreme is not going to work too. Uh, and you were not making that point to be clarified on this too. But I was making an example. For example, talking about Montreal. I like Montreal setting up now in that I think we have different cultural centers, uh, Islamic centers. It's orient the orientation is based on the language. But I think the beauty of that is that different groups are trying to have, hold different stones. In that we have different, we have Ansari, we have a Quran gathering which is in English. So I think when someone is taking care of that, we have to help for that one, to that English one, for example, to be strong. For example, I, I received a call from a friend of mine that she has a friend in a school that she's becoming interested in Islam. Where should I go? And I said, don't come to Iranian ones, don't go to there, that one, that one. I know a good group. So just having one or two in the city is enough. If all the centers are trying to fragment their limited resources, because we are on limited resources, and the problem is that the active person in different communities, we pretty much know all of them. Uh, there are not many. And if you are active in, for example, if we have, for example, one center in Arabic and you are active in that, you can't be very active in the other one. Because of that, I'm trying to help in my community people Having an eye on what uh, Sheikh was saying, that also being open if someone in convert comes in to, to take care of him or her. Look at if she's new, welcome her. Try to find someone English, explain her, and so forth. So welcome her in the community. But if we have a strong one, try to strengthen, to make that one stronger. And if we have, I mean, the Ansari, the beauty of that, we have different cultures, one or two campaign. Like this in a year, bridging between, between different, I mean, if we invest in the bridging between those communities, rather than having a lot of investment in each of those centers and convincing everybody, which is a part time, and I agree with the main point that it's really, it, it may work in the long run better. It's, you know, I agree, but however, there's two things now. Are, are, are we serving identity? Uh, and are we serving, uh, what, how do we define our identity? This is really important questions. Uh, are we, first of all, Muslims? And then we are hearing in wherever it is, or are we? And this is very important. It's how we can accommodate. And this is where the important part. I agree that centers are extremely important. They really need the right. Why? Because it's to uh, have the older generation transcend to the new generation. The new generation. However, to have also another one, which is very important and critical. I think even the new generation, some of them, some of them they go to certain Iranian or Pakistani, whatever it is, and they don't even understand what the shit is talking about. And I think even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Quran is mentioning when we have created different languages for you to understand each other. So, uh, and if sometimes English becomes a meme for people to understand each other, but without, like, you know, uh, compromise on our Arabic or our version or uh, our true identity, then it's important we have to go hand in hand. But to just localize or label yourself as me and this and that's it, then it becomes very, uh, it's not segregating yourself, but it, in, in the same time, as I'm giving you an example, me and Montreal, there is no Montreal center, it's in Montreal. But I try to fit in every center and try to learn from every center because I know that through all my experience, I have learned new things from Persian, from the Lebanese, from Iraqis. And there really matters. There are some things 
their cultural knowledges, they are very important, and they even define uh, the uh, Islamic identity for, for Egypt. And I think that just to have an outcome debate in perspective, this is very important, which means, okay, there is the Persian, whatever it is, but you have to add, which is the language, French or English, 